commemoration of the bicentennial year, First National Bank of Venice presents this history of the Venice area. First National Bank, since its organization in 1963, has always been sensitive to any program of civic improvement. Our lives and our fortunes are here. We are proud of our contribution to the economic and cultural well-being of our citizens. We look forward to a bright future for our country and for our beloved Venice. It is in this spirit that we present this film. There's history to every place. A lot of folks don't bother to give the past a second thought. They don't realize that everything that makes up the present was brought about by the blood and the sweat of people who came before them. Looking ahead, the same still holds true today. The year was 1868. Migrating from Georgia and northern Florida, the Reverend Jesse L. Knight, his wife Rebecca, and their 15 children came to a broad creek near the head of what is now known as Donna Bay. They uh, had trouble getting their stock across the water, and they decided that they'd take some of the old hides that they had behind in their wagon and shake them and scare the horses and get them across that way, and they did. And that's why they called Shake It Creek. That's where they shook the hides. Frank Heigel, a former Union Naval officer, arrived in the Venice Nokomis area in the year 1881. At that time, the entire area from Osprey to Englewood was known as Horse and Chaise because of a formation of trees seen from the Gulf. Heigel had made the long trip from Atlantic City in a canoe sailboat. He purchased a hundred acres of cultivated land from Richard R. Roberts for $25 an acre. Of the families that when my grandfather came here, there was the Currys and the Knights, the Lowe's, the Reeds and the Blackburns, and that was about the extent. One by one they come, but it was all pioneering people, and took a pioneering spirit to fight it out, make it go. The name Venice was given to the Nokomis area by Frank Heigl. My granddad named Venice in 1895. He named it Venice because coming from Alsace Lorraine and lacking the Venice area and its waterways to Venice, Italy, and he suggested Venice be the post office. This name was later transferred to the present Venice location through the influence of Mrs. Potter Palmer. It was through her influence at the Seaboard Airline Railway in 1911 extended the line as far as Venice, a relatively insignificant community at that time. Various other names were then used for the Nokomis area. In my early days of memory, I believe it was in the early 1900s, after the post office was moved to Venice, I can remember Nokomis before ever it was Nokomis being Dundee where Ben Dunn's father called it. At one time it was named Potter, too. During the early pioneering days, the Venice Nokomis area was a land of plenty. We had uh, panthers here and some bear, and we had lots of game. When I first came here, there was plenty of deer right around here and turkeys. There were a lot of pigs, wild pigs that we used to hunt. We uh, got quite a few ducks. When I talk about snook, we try very hard now to catch uh, one. Uh, as a boy, we used to fish with a hand line and could fill a wash tub in 30 minutes on an outgoing tide using mullet heads. My mother used to uh, ask us if we would like fish for supper, and we'd say yes, and so she said, would say, what kind? And we'd name one, and then she'd say, go get it. And that was just about that simple. The settlers of the Venice-Nokomis area were practically isolated. 
transportation by land was almost non-existent. See, all the travel we went to Sarasota was all by water. We didn't have any automobiles and no roads. Up until 1914, I think it was, in 1915, there wasn't any highway came into Venice at all. And all our transportation was done by water. I remember when uh, one of my uncles used to make the only trip by boat to Sarasota and Tampa once a week and brought all the supplies back to the people here. He mailed everything. Now, Casey's Pass was up where Nokomis Public Beach is. And long about in the early 1900s, they had a terrible storm and the erosion, all that went with it, closed that path. And the rainwater flooded the entire area. And the people in the Venice area all got together with mules and scoops and went to the present site where Casey's Pass is today and cut a swath through the mangoes to let that overflow of water run out into the Gulf of Mexico. And it washed that out, and Casey's Pass has remained there ever since. I'll never forget one of the first cars I think I ever saw when I was a kid growing up. Will Warren came down here in a Buick Roadster. It must have been about 1910 or 11, maybe 1912. And he came all the way from Sarasota down on the old dirt road. But it was something to drive an automobile down there. And you didn't have anything but sand roads. It was just ruts cut down through the scrub. Now, the highway was put in here about 19 and 6, 17, 16, 17. Well, between here and Sarasota, we had a nine-foot paved road. Now, nine foot doesn't sound like much of a road, and it wasn't either. It was all right if you were the only uh, automobile on the road. But every time you passed anybody, you had to go half off the road and half on, get on the shoulder. But the real key to the future came in 1921, when Dr. Fred H. Albee, a world-renowned orthopedic surgeon, purchased a large part of the Venice Nokomis area from the Palmer Estate. You might say he's the basic reason that Venice and Nokomis is here. Dr. Albee envisioned a great city consisting of Venice and Nokomis. He started by developing Nokomis in what he called Bay Point. He then employed a famous city planner, John Nolan, to design a complete city, Venice, from the ground up. It was to be a resort city with a well-balanced combination of residential, industrial, and agricultural areas. In 1925, Dr. Albee aroused the interest of the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers in the Venice concept and sold them 15,000 acres south of Nokomis. Eventually, the Brotherhood, one of the country's richest unions, increased its holdings to 60,000 acres. From that point on, men, money, and machinery poured into Venice at a dizzying rate. From 1925 to 1929, an incredible $18 million was spent in development. It was purely an investment. It was not somebody's dream that their membership would all retire here. Naturally, they figured some of them would. But at that time, they were the top labor organization in the country. In an almost unbelievable few years, the BLE Realty Company, the development firm for the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers, turned nearly seven miles of raw Gulf frontage and more than 50,000 acres into the modern city that is the basis of today's Venice. In 1926, one of the most successful schemes dreamed up to put Venice in the national news was the promotion of the first national tarpon tournament. Newspapers all over the country ran stories about the spectacular contest, and the Grant and Rice Sportlight movies were shown in most theaters. This is one of the principal tarpon areas back in the uh, 30s. It was not uncommon for them to bring uh, oh, 30 or 40 a day. Brought an awful lot of people here, you know, and uh, actually the old, what was known as the Villa Nokomis Hotel, was about the only place here that could accommodate uh, guests at that particular time, and of course they were booked for a full season, and it was almost exclusively tarpon fishermen. Oh, fishing was good. Fishing was good. You know, the best fishing on this west coast at any place in, in Florida at one time. 
In less than two years, the land was cleared, streets and roads were laid out and built, as well as homes, apartments, hotels, and entire business blocks. In terms of modern technology, this is not too amazing. But in 1926, every tool, every piece of equipment, and all building materials had to be transported to or manufactured at the site. Manpower had to be found, brought to Venice, housed and fed. A veritable army at the height of construction, consisting of over 3,000 black and 5,000 white construction workers. It was planned from the ground up, economic-wise as well as resort-wise. To the east, they cleared thousands of acres of land. Because back in those days, five, ten-acre truck farms were very popular. People made a living off of them. They brought their produce to market and sold it. Well, that was to pour the money into the town site on the off-season. And then the golf frontage was to be developed into a resort area so that the two economies would balance themselves. Industrial businesses were established which were needed in the construction of the new city. Lumber companies, machine shops, sheet metal workers, septic tank manufacturers, marine ways, and tile manufacturers. A strict architectural code stipulated that all construction, residential and business, was to be done in northern Italian style. The new city of Venice, designed to be the showplace of the nation, developed as if by magic. The community was incorporated as the city of Venice on May 4th, 1927. Then, the Florida land boom ended. The bottom dropped out of real estate values and customers dwindled to nothing. The Brotherhood tried to stave off complete disaster. If it wasn't for the BLE Realty Corporation, the whole county had gone broke. They were the only payroll in this county for a while. But by April 1929, the BLE announced the development was closed down indefinitely. Much of the unsold property reverted to Dr. Alden. After the crash, Venice went into a sort of hibernation, which was to last for years. I said, hell, I can sour to death of pleasure here, which is the truth. So I decided this is where I was going to stay at that point. Didn't make practically anything. People making three and four dollars a week and left. And hell, I had fish and rabbit and gopher and swamp cabbage and this, that, and other, whatever I could get. And we got by, me and the wife. I don't know how we did it hardly. We fished to eat. And where the jetties are today, many time I went down there and didn't come back until I did have a fish. That's all we had to eat. As a matter of fact, they raised what they could. And they fished what they could fish. And that's about the way they lived. Of course, they had enough money. They could uh, do a little job here, a little job there to get enough to buy their salt and their and their staples, flour. But uh, they just lived off the land. Venice existed as a ghost city for many years. At one point, there were only 15 families left in town. He looked up and down. Well, says you got three cars on the street, ain't you? I said, yeah, but I think one of them fixing to leave now. We had streets in Venice or nothing but weeds for 25 years. You could shoot a cannon down the street most any time and not have to worry about hitting anybody. Finally, in 1932, a glimmer of hope appeared in the form of the Kentucky Military Institute, which bought the Venice Hotel and the San Marco Hotel as winter quarters for its cadets. And that was just like uh, giving a shot of adrenaline to a guy with a heart condition. And you can't bring, you know, three or four hundred people into a town and not mean something. Well, at one time, it was, uh, it was the only thing that really sustained the merchants in the, in the wintertime, particularly because we were a tourist-oriented village, and uh, when KMI came here, complete with their faculty, and uh, the students, uh, this encouraged a lot of the parents, uh, say, to come to Venice and spend the 
four months in the winter. And uh, it was quite an economic boost that uh, without it, uh, some of the stores, for example, here in town would have had a difficult time surviving. In 1933, Dr. Albee established the world-famed Florida Medical Center. After the Brotherhood left, he took over the old hotel and converted it into a hospital. And uh, attracted uh, patients from all over the country. He uh, had a, a, an air ambulance service, provided many benefits for many, many people, and I'm sure uh, contributed to a certain extent of many jobs to the, to the local economy. The next economic boost to the community came in 1941 with the establishment of a U.S. Army Air Base. And that was perhaps the biggest kicker that the city's ever had. It really got it off the ground and it uh, introduced it to uh, thousands of people that came here for training and wouldn't have otherwise seen it. The base was closed in 1946, but many of the Air Force personnel returned later to live in the Venice area. In 1947, the base was deeded to the city without cost for use as a municipal airport, including more than a mile of valuable Gulf beachfront. In 1952, the W&A Construction Company of New York started a new economic boom in the area by opening a subdivision called South Venice. A nationwide advertising campaign offered 40-foot lots at $200 per lot. Nobody expected what actually happened when it went on the market. Hell, when the day was open, you couldn't even see the lots. In 1953, it was just woods. And when I tell you the people were lined up in automobiles and come by plane and boat, I'm not lying to you. All you had to do is stand there and take an order. And that sparked the economy of the whole west coast of Florida, no question about it. We needed people because in order to expand our various uh, civic projects, we, we had to have people. And we wanted other people here. We wanted them to come and enjoy Venice. The phenomenal response enabled the South Venice development to sell almost 20,000 lots in a little over two years. And that really was the takeoff from that point on in South Venice. I mean, then it naturally started growing just like other places did. Inspired by the legacy of the past, new leaders moved forward producing a bonanza of public projects which greatly enhanced the city and gave it new vitality. In 1960, a modern $1,500,000 sanitary sewer system and disposal plant was completed, an absolute necessity if the city was to expand. Almost all the streets in Venice were paved and metal street signs were installed. In 1951, the present Venice Hospital was established. Over the years, it has been constantly expanded and upgraded to keep pace with the growing population as well as new medical techniques. A new addition to the water plant was built. A $170,000 fishing pier was constructed off the airport beach. Between 1953 and 1958, a unique multi-million dollar school complex was constructed, consisting of an elementary school, a junior high, a senior high, and an athletic field. Later, in 1975, a modern 630-seat auditorium was added to the complex to serve the schools and the community. In 1957 and 58, we built the police and fire department for $40,000. The city hall was finished in 1959. We built that for $60,000. We built the beach pavilion for $40,000. Its roof, an innovative hyperbolic paraboloid, a landmark of distinction for beautiful Venice Public Beach. In 1959, the Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey Combined Circus moved their winter quarters to the Venice Airport after 32 years in Sarasota. 
the relocation of the circus proved to be another economic boon to the community, as well as an additional attraction to potential new residents. In 1963, the controversial $13 million intracoastal waterway was begun. The 9-foot deep, 100-foot wide inland canal was excavated five and a half miles between Roberts Bay and Lemon Bay in three years and included the construction of three drawbridges. In 1965, a public library was built. In 1969, an art building. And in 1970, occupying the site of the old Gulf Breeze Hotel, a new post office. High rises. Shopping centers. New businesses, theaters, restaurants, apartment complexes, all contributed to the dynamics of a progressive city, healthy and growing. Venice has fulfilled those plans of the past that lay dormant for so long and has gone on to emerge as a modern city far surpassing those original dreams. Our city of beauty will continue to provide the good life for a growing number of dedicated citizens. This was a, just a delightful place to live. Everybody knew everyone, and, uh, and, and it was just great. Oh, it was wonderful. I didn't realize it at the time, but it really was. Uh, of course, our principal activity was, uh, as far as kids were concerned, was swimming and hunting and fish, fishing, things of this nature. Well, our lifestyle was very simple. We were happy to sit by the road and watch the cars go by. Venice is a rare town. I don't know, there's an atmosphere of friendliness and uh, general uh, congeniality among the people that reside in the area. We couldn't have picked a better spot to live. Venice was nearly uh, the perfect community to raise youngsters in. So I have uh, four children and I have I've been very happy to have them in a place like this uh, uh, because they've grown and had the things the opportunity to do things that I didn't as a child. Uh, a minimum of the bad things, and I think a lot of the good things. I wouldn't trade it. In the terms of quality of life, I don't think you can match it anywhere to the size of the town we have. I hope Venice grows the way it is about the same speed. We're, we're not growing too fast. I don't believe you can shut the door on anyone. The reason I think the community will continue to grow is because they'll come here for the same reasons that I came here. The sun, the sea, the, the temperature, uh, the community. But I'll tell you, I, uh, I love the city, I love Venice. It's the reason I've stayed here all these years. I love Venice. I, th I think about him a whole lot. I was talking with a fellow the other day, and he told me, he said, if I just had your remembrance, I'd be happy.